I want to share a few excerpts from uh, this book, Serious Adverse Events, An Uncensored History of AIDS by Celia Farber, uh, with a foreword by Mark Crispin Miller. This was published in 2006, and it basically became impossible to find. Uh, she also wrote, Celia Farber wrote an article in Oh God, now I've forgotten, um, and I've closed down Acrobat. Uh, I think it was Harper's, it might have been Atlantic. I think it was Harper's, um, and it's not coming open for me, um, in 2006 as well, which is still available, which you, which you can find. But uh, what has happened now in um, last month <clears throat> is that the excellent publishing house, Chelsea Green, has republished this book. And uh, I encourage everyone to get it and to read it. I am going to be um, sort of reviewing it and, and publishing a little excerpt on my Substack this week on Tuesday on Natural Selections, and I wanted to share a few short excerpts here today. Um, again, it is, it, you know, it is a, it's called Serious Adverse Events by Celia Farber, uh, republished by Chelsea Green uh, Publishers, and she walks through the history of AIDS, which those of us who were, you know, we were young teenagers as AIDS uh, came on the scene. And uh, my mother had a number of gay male friends in a couple of different domains in her life. And so I remember being um, very, uh, very struck by and af affected by this sudden scourge that was mostly afflicting gay men in, in the United States. So if I may add one bit of color to that yeah i remember most profoundly the era where the syndrome had been recognized it was clear that it was circulating amongst gay men yeah. but there was no awareness of what might be causing it and i remember the uh the searching for a plausible cause in light of the way that this thing spread across a population um that that was a very frightening era where nobody knew what it was that was causing it, and um, and uh, they were looking for some explanation that you know there was an investigation of like sex toys and lubricants and things. Is it some toxin? Uh, so anyway, that was a very uh, remarkable era to to watch science try to wrap its mind around around this uh, disease. Yeah, and um, you know one of the one of the things in this book is uh, the, the proposal by not one, not two, but, but several scientists, some of whom are Nobel Prize winners like Carrie Mullis, uh, that the conclusion that was arrived at apparently after you know, all, of this, all of this research and you know, extraordinarily well uh, defended, which is that HIV is the single causal factor in AIDS, um, isn't true. And those scientists who made these claims were then, and um, to a large degree, remain now, uh, unable to to speak about it, and you know, lost lost their labs, lost their graduate students, lost their lost their grants, lost their ability to publish, uh, because you were not allowed to to say this thing. And as Carrie Mullis uh, says, and I think this is in. I don't have it on my screen here. I think it's something I'm going to um, put in together for my for natural selections. Uh, he says, "I just started asking people." I said, "You know, I'm 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 writing about this again." He won the Nobel Prize for the invention of PCR, okay, of polymerase chain reaction, uh, which also then was the tool used for tests for AIDS and now tests for COVID, which he did not think was the appropriate use of PCR. Separate story. Uh, he in writing about uh, AIDS uh, at conferences and, and such would approach people and say, okay, I'm writing about this. And um, my you know, opening sentence is what everyone knows, right? Which is that HIV causes AIDS. I just want to reference. I just want to reference because um, what you do in science is you reference everything that isn't such long established common knowledge that there can be no reference, right? Things, honestly, things like um, mammals are sexually reproducing species with two and only two sexes. That is such commonly established knowledge that there isn't any primary reviewed literature that says that because we've known that for so long. Um, but anything that is newly 
uh, newly discovered, even if everyone seems to believe it, uh, or um, that there is any disagreement about whatsoever, you're supposed to reference, you're supposed to have a citation so that other scientists and anyone else who wants to can go in and, and basically um, track, track the argument back and say, you know, I, I'm not sure I believe that, or, oh, interesting, let me, let me get to the base of that, let me see on what basis we know that, and, and go there. And um, Kerry Mullis report, reported, he is dead now, um, reported that when he was asking this of people in the um, 80s and 90s, um, can I just get the reference on that, any reference, there must be lots, uh, that no one ever came up with one. And uh, that, <clears throat> to him and to all scientists, should should be enough to raise suspicions about on what basis it is uh, that we have a conclusion that is so universally agreed upon when um, it is both new and there doesn't appear to be a single piece of research uh, that establishes that it is true. A couple things. One, when I first heard that Carrie Mullis was not a believer, HIV denialist. Uh, yeah, I, I misunderstood it. I thought, oh, this is a chemist underappreciating the complexity of the problem. There are reasons mm -hmm. that you might have a syndrome that is generally caused by a virus that is not inherently caused by a virus because other things can interrupt the cascade of uh, physiological pathways, um, etc. Mm -hmm. I did not really understand the argument that he was making. I would also point out it's not just Kerry Mullis. It's also oh, yeah. Luc Montagnier, yep. who is... Uh, who actually discovered HIV. Exactly, and it believed it to be causal. It, was, it wasn't Gallo who took credit for it and and made the claim um, yeah. that HIV uh, is the only causal factor in AIDS, although even he backed off from that briefly. Um, but it was Luc Montagnier. It was Luc Montagnier, mm -hmm. and he is also now dead. He was very old, unlike Kerry Mullis, who died recently and was not so old. Um, but in any case, Luc Montagnier changed his position, even though that was at great personal expense. A, it damaged his credibility, probably should not have, but damaged his credibility. And B, his great achievement uh, was the, the contribution of the discovery of this, and so the recognition that it might not be as important as he had orig originally thought, uh, suggested uh, a very honorable scientist, somebody mm -hmm. who would reverse his position even though it decreased the importance of his role in the history of science. Yes. Okay, a couple of, a couple of short... Oh, wait, one more thing. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to point out why it is that we should be able to ask anything that is not common knowledge, you know, that is so longstanding that we... Uh, can't find the original reference, that you should just always be able to have a reference. And I want to point out that the telomere story, which mm -hmm. many uh, listeners of this podcast will be familiar with. And which is relevant here. There's there's a whole lot in this book about um, drug safety and drug safety testing. Drug safety testing. And there's a whole lot uh, about things like COVID that involves the degradation of tissues, which will accelerate aging. So anyway, there's, this is a highly relevant topic. But the obstacle to figuring out that little puzzle was an erroneous result. The result was what the people who had done the work said it was, but it didn't mean what they said it was. You had to be able to go back and figure out that they had all gotten their mice from a related source in order to understand that actually that source was polluting our understanding of uh, basically mouse telomeres. We thought they were much longer than they actually are because it was laboratory mice that had had their telomeres elongated by a breeding program that uh, selected for long telomeres. So anyway, it's a perfect case where, you know, there's a two week period in which I was trying to figure out why this piece of information that everybody stated casually as if it was just, you know, so clearly right that, you know, it was, it was like, bedrock hmm. how could it possibly not be right and the answer was oh they all ordered their mice from the same place right so you have to be able to trace it back for that kind of reason yes yes exactly so here's a <clears throat> short excerpt from <clears throat> excuse me the beginning of the book uh page 29 Today's scientists are wholly dependent for their survival upon the will of a conjoined financial megalopolis connecting government, academia, and the biotech and pharmaceutical industries. Again, this book was written in 2006. If you talk to them, they almost all speak of fear, fear of losing their funding. 
Minds attuned consciously and unconsciously to the roar of the industry, scientists writing grants that are designed to feed and fuel it, writing more and more grants in shorter and shorter intervals than ever before, says Richard Stroman. You have to write a grant a year almost, and you have to write four to get one if you're any good. I got out just in time. Everybody who's still in there says the same thing. It's going to hell in a handbasket. Before the biotech boom, we never had this incessant urging to produce something useful, meaning profitable. Under these circumstances, everybody is caught up in it. Grants, millions of dollars flowing into laboratories, careers and stars being made. The only way to be a successful scientist today is to follow consensus. The academy has become the technology it invented. It's lost its scientific edge and replaced it with a technology that follows the market. The tension between the two is that science is primarily a generator of surprises, whereas technology is anything but surprises. If you're going to produce something and put it on the market, you don't want any goddamn surprises. You've got the next quarter to report and you don't want any bad news. It's all about the short term now. So that's part of the setup for um, what we then see with regard to how the rapid consensus around uh, the single um, retroviral cause of AIDS was arrived at, and also then um, the treatments. The um, now we know largely not safe and not effective treatments uh, that were pushed to market very fast, uh, things like AZT and protease inhibitors uh, for AIDS. Thank you.